Komen, Dumela, Kalibuni, Meraba, Shalom, Nihau. Um, I want to introduce my son, Daniel, who is operating the video camera. Um, Hello. The idea is that these may be, this might be useful for the distance course. So I thought I can take a look and see what I look like and see, you know, lamented or something. But uh, uh, it might be useful to have for the distance course. So that's the reason. But then we're going to be going to the labs with the camera to particularly focus on the teaching assistant in order to have a tape that would be useful for a teaching assistant training. So uh, we will try not to get people who don't want to be on the camera, just you know, kind of indicate as you're there, because uh, we might take a pan of the room or something. And if there's anything on it that you don't like, with miracles of digital editing, we can remove you and replace you with somebody who would like to be there. So uh, you, this is not meant to be an invasion on your privacy. So today I talk about causal inference, but of course, before we get to that, we have to have a little thing to liven us up. Mr. Harris, thanks, Professor. Um, why didn't he give you back your term paper, Zip? This is my term paper. That's a book, dude, by Stephen Ambrose. You didn't write that. Neither did he. At least a lot of it. I figured if he could take credit for it, so could I. Sound logic, so how'd you do? Let's see. A little derivative, but solid. B+. Plus. Wow, you ought to try to publish it, man. Don't do that at home, right? Uh, and then this is uh, from PC Magazine, Abort, Retry, Fail. Word for Windows 6.0, Self-Teaching Guide. This book makes a good guide, but surprisingly limits its audience to half by assuming that the reader is working in Windows. Or, since this is a lecture that will deal with some data analysis issues, I thought you'd like a little joke about a statistician. Three professors, a physicist, a chemist, and a statistician, are called in to see their dean. Just as they arrive, the dean is called out of his office, leaving the three professors there. The professors see with alarm that there is a fire in the wastebasket. The physicist says, I know what to do. We must cool down the materials until their temperature is lower than the ignition temperature, and then the fire will go out. The chemist says, no, no, I know what to do. We must cut off the supply of oxygen so that the fire will go out due to the lack of one of the reactants. While the physicists and chemists debate what course to take, they both are alarmed to see the statistician running around the room starting other fires. They both scream, what are you doing? To which the statistician replies, trying to get an adequate sample size. OK, well, anyway, on to the lecture. So um, even though this is a lecture about causal inference, <coughs> excuse me, causal inference and, data, and uh, data analysis, I want to start with a few words about data management. The first thing we do with data is we have to manage it. And epidemiologic studies usually deal with lots of data, so epidemiologic, managing epidemiologic data is mass production. Mass production means that you have to have careful procedures, you have to have training, the people who will be doing it, you have to have supervision, overview, checks, and, uh, and uh, verifications, and so on. Because epidemiology can be dealing with hundreds of thousands of observations, and you won't be able to do that yourself. So a systematic, organized, and professional approach is critical for detecting and avoiding problems. And you may remember this slide that I showed you. You can never, take, never, never take anything for granted. Uh, this was the, uh, the, the quote, the, the statement made by the Vice President for Flight Systems at Lockheed Martin Ar Astronautics, whose engineering team reported measurements in English units that the Mars Climate Orbiter Navigation Team assumed were metric units. They left out the specification of the units, and as a result, we lost a multi-billion dollar space probe. This is just, this is some data here from the National Survey of Family Growth, the 1995 National Survey of Family Growth from the National Center for Health Statistics. My colleague, Dr. Ada Adamora, and I analyzed these to uh, look at concurrent sexual partnerships in the United States. Um, <coughs> what, would, what would be the usefulness of these data if you didn't have the documentation? And yet people sometimes go to fairly good lengths to protect their data, but they omit to save the documentation. And obviously, they're totally useless without the documentation. Sandra Greenland, epidemiology guru, says that our data say nothing at all, because the data are simply observer notes, respondent answers, biochemical measurements, and contents of medical records, or machine-readable data sets. But until we can ascribe meaning to them, they don't actually say anything to us. So what does one do with them? So the first step in data management is to design a data management system. Design the process by which the data will be collected, 
and to write down all the data collection procedures. Then you have to train and supervise and sometimes retrain the data collectors. And you have to monitor the data collection activities because as I said in an earlier lecture, just because you've trained people to do things doesn't mean that they will do them or will do them to your satisfaction. You want to document all the important data collection experiences so that later it will be possible to reconstruct what happened or to reconstruct how issues were res resolved that one might remember. And very importantly, keep track of, document, and safeguard the data and the documentation. Why do I harp on this? I mean, it must be the most basic principle that, of course, you safeguard your data. Uh, but as a matter of fact, um, a project I worked on when I was a student here, uh, my boss was supposed to be backing up the data, and he didn't, and there was a disk crash, and as a result, we almost lost a whole year of work. It was only because we'd actually shared a copy of our data sets and programs with another organization and that they hadn't just deleted the file that we were able to get their tape and we lost only a couple of months. Uh, the American College of Epidemiology had to recreate its member da membership database when it was lost. And in November 2002, thieves stole the hard drives from nine personal computers in the Epidemiological and Communicable Disease Unit at the Indian Council of Medical Research in New Delhi. There was apparently no backup. So you see, epidemiologists are as fallible as anybody in this regard, and it is very important to safeguard multiple backups of your data. So the next steps in data management are to review, edit, and code the data forms to document the exceptions and the actions that were taken. What do I mean by edit data forms? Well, you often have to clean data because real data comes with imperfections, inconsistencies. So you want to check for illegal or improbable values, pregnant men or is an example of an illegal value, or people who are maybe seven feet tall but weigh only 100 pounds, um, or improbable values or improbable combinations of values. And so you have people go through every data form, and they also go through the computerized data and make do cross tabs and scatter plots and so on to try to find what look like problems. Be a sleuth. Be skeptical be looking for problems in the data, and then prepare summaries of it so you can have a sense of what's going on on a larger scale. So <clears throat> here's what your statistician never told you probably about analyzing data. You've learned about p-values, maybe you've learned about confidence intervals, maybe you've learned about regression, but before you get to those steps, real data analysts do some other things first. The first thing they do is they examine the data when David Kleinbaum was teaching BIOS 145 some years ago, it's quite a few years and I took it, and at a certain point in the course we learned about linear models and multiple regression and all that stuff, and I said, well Dave, what do you do actually when you get a set of data? And he started talking about, well, you look at the data. No one had ever said to me that you look at the data. So you examine frequency distributions, cross tabulations, scatter plots, and you're being alert for surprises and su suspicious findings. You examine the means and the prevalences for factors of interest overall, and you look within interesting subgroups. You look at associations, prevalence ratios, relative risks, odds ratios. You look at correlations. Um, and you're looking not only to find problems with the data, but its characteristics. Because, for example, a variable may be distributed with a strong skew. Many statistical procedures assume that a variable is distributed symmetrically. So if you are using such a procedure with a variable that actually has a long tail, the, procedure, the statistical procedure will give you a misleading result. So it's very important to be aware of what the data actually look like so you can choose the appropriate statistical procedure or make a transformation if necessary. Well, it's a good idea to have a written analysis plan based, of course, on your research questions. You're doing your dissertation or your master's thesis collected a lot of data, you've got it all transcribed, and you've cleaned it and all that sort of stuff. And then all of a sudden you're sitting there and this computer is staring you in the face, kind of daring you to do something with those data. And in that situation, and you, you, know, you produce your tables and you look at them and stuff, it's very easy to say, where was I? What am I trying to do? I don't understand, I'm lost. It happens very frequently. So if you have your analysis plan, you pull out your analysis plan, which you formulated in advance, and it tells you what you're going to do. And typically, you would carry out some crude analyses. You would look at two-by-twos, you would compare incidence rates, risk ratios, whatever, uh, and then you try some analyses controlling for important variables. 
You would often do that by stratified analysis. Stratification means that you divide the data into subgroups. Let's look at the men and the women separately. We'll divide the groups up by age. We'll divide the, the data up by region of the country or whatever. You look at all these different stratifications to see whether you're seeing the same kind of pattern in each one. If not, then that indicates a need to look within. Of course, that assumes that the numbers are adequate, because if the numbers are small, then you'll see different things wherever you look, because of random fluctuations. Even when you're going to do, use mathematical modeling for your main analyses, as most people do, it's still valuable to do some stratified analysis first. So I mentioned that we divide the data set into subsets, we examine the estimates and associations within each subset, and then, if we want to do something that's a summary measure, we can take averages across the subsets. That's essentially what we did in age, strat age standardization or age adjustment. We divide the data by age, we then compute averages across the summarization, across the strata, and that controls for the variable that we stratified for. So what's mathematical modeling? Mathematical modeling is now what everybody uses, but when I was training in epidemiology, it was the new thing. And the reason is that the computer programs and the computer capabilities are available now, and they weren't available 50 years ago, 40 years ago. They weren't available 50 years ago, but I wasn't either. <clears throat> so the way mathematical modeling works is we express the outcome. Outcome might be disease or probability of becoming a case as some mathematical function of the relevant covariables. Covariables is a term that means an exposure variable, potential confounders, uh, other variables of interest that we think might, have some, might be relevant or have, a, have an effect on the outcome. So we create some function. It can be as simple a function as saying that the probability of disease is equal to uh, some constant plus some multiple of the number of cigarettes smoked plus some multiple of age plus some multiple of cholesterol, whatever. So we have this mathematical form, mathematical function, and we're trying to predict some outcome. And then we fit this function to the data so that it models the relations in the data. Fitting means that these, this, this function has certain places to adjust it. And so we tweak it so that it comes closer to giving us something that represents the data. And I have an analogy that may help with that. Then we have a model that has been fit to the data and we interpret the resulting model to draw inferences about the associations in the data. So here's my analogy for mathematical modeling and statistical procedures in general. Let's say that you want to sew a pair of pants. And I apologize to those of you like me who've never done that. You want, to, first you have to select, well, what kind of pants should they be? Now you could sew without a pattern. You could just start, you know, stitching away and stuff, but that takes time and the result might look, not look so good. So you say, well, I want to pick, I want a pair of pants that meets the need, dress pants, casual pants, work pants, whatever, and I find a pattern that will provide that kind of result. And well, how do you pick a pattern? Well, you want to pick one that you've maybe seen, you want to choose something that you've seen people wearing because you want it to be well received. And if you pick something that other people are wearing, that people say, oh, what a lovely pair of pants, you figure, well, okay, mine will be well received too. Or you might look at a fashion magazine so the way they do statistics is that you look for some available statistical model that will fit the situation you have, the design of the, the way the data were collected, uh, other aspects of the situation. You might pick the binomial model or the normal distribution or the chi-square distribution or a linear model. And you say, well, have other people used this? Have they published articles with it? Because if they have, you feel more likely that and you feel more confident that this will work for you. Or has it appeared in a methodology article in a statistics journal, which is kind of like the biostatistician's equivalent of the fashion magazine. So you then have a form of the model, and it's this pattern, and you summarize the data in terms of that statistical model. So a statistical distribution has some parameters that you want to estimate. So maybe a mean and a standard deviation. The mean tells you where on the real number line the distribution is centered. Um, the standard deviation tells you how spread out the distribution is. So you've got this, this, this pattern, and you're trying to fit it now to the person that you're wanting to, uh, to sew the pair of pants for. But of course, you should always look at the data, because just because you've come up with a statistical distribution, and you say, well, it has a mean of this and a standard devi deviation of that, the distributions that fit that category could look very different. 
Now, I, don't, I haven't been able to draw them with different standard deviations, so I have a, a reference that has some. I mean, the same standard deviation, different curves. But here's an example of two curves with the same mean, but they look totally different. So if this is what you're assuming is the distribution, but it actually is like this, then your results can be quite misleading when you go to interpret them. Just as if you're sewing a pattern, for, if you're sewing a pair of pants for some person, you would actually like to look at the person before you proceed. P-values, we know, are ubiquitous in health research, and they're also widely misunderstood. So here is my attempt to give you an intuitive idea of how p-values work. A p-value might be regarded as the probability of obtaining an interesting looking sample from a boring population. And there is an analogy here with one minus specificity, the false positive rate, and we'll get to that in a little while. Statistical power, in contrast, might be regarded as the probability of obtaining an interesting looking sample from an interesting population, which its parallel, the analogy here is sensitivity. So in both cases, what we're talking about is the probability of obtaining an interesting looking sample. And the question is, what population is going to give us that interesting sample? So for example, let's suppose that this is, an, this is a boring population over here, and I've put a zero here to indicate that it has a log odds ratio of zero. Um, we're, our measure of association in this example is the odds ratio, but because the odds ratio is not symmetrically distributed, I'm using the log odds ratio uh, because it's, it works better for showing you a diagram. A log odds ratio of 0.7 is just the same as an odds ratio of two. So when you see this 0.7, you can think of it as being an odds ratio of two. And this 0.5 here is an odds ratio of about, I think, uh, 1.65. So don't worry about the numbers, but basically, let's assume that an odds ratio of one has a log odds ratio of zero. So this boring population, there's no association in the real population, is represented by this curve on the left. And then on the right, I have an example of an interesting population. In this interesting population, the log odds ratio is 0.7, the odds ratio is 2, and so there's an association that might be interesting for me to, in terms of what I'm studying. And let's say I observe this value in my study. I have my 2 by 2 table, I can get the odds ratio, I take the log, and it's 0.5 or odds ratio 1.65. So my question is now, does this result come from this boring population or from the interesting population? And of course, that's what makes all the difference, because what I'm interested in is not the sample. I'm interested in talking about what's going on in the population. Unfortunately, it's not so easy to come up with the probability that this represents an interesting population, or conversely, the probability that this is due to chance, which is how we usually describe it. It's much more practical to come up with the probability that a boring population will give you a result that is as interesting as this or more interesting, and that's the p-value. So in this diagram then, we see that the curve on the left, the distribution of samples that would come from a boring population, has a little bit of area here that is to the right of this study finding, which suggests that there is some probability, the area of this curve, uh, under this curve is the probability in this diagram that we would get a, an interesting sample from this boring population. And because most of the time we all deal with two-sided p-values, I'm going to assume that an interesting looking sample means one that is here or bigger or here or smaller. So that the p-value is actually these two areas together. Well, what we'd like to be able to do, of course, would be able to say, Okay, so what's the probability that my result was due to chance? But as I said, we can't say that. The p-value does not tell me the probability that what I observed was due to chance. Why is that? Well, let's suppose that I study only boring populations. I'm a very unimaginative epidemiologist, so I only come up with ideas that actually don't mean anything. Well, if I study only boring populations, by chance, some of my samples will come out with interesting findings, right? Because we know there is variability in what samples come out with. So this area here, this area here, 
will be the probability of getting interesting samples from these boring populations. But if I'm studying only boring populations, then what's the probability that these interesting samples come from boring populations? 100%, because that's all I'm studying. So clearly, that's not going to be what we think of as the p-value, even though the p-value for this finding might be 05 or 03 or 01 or whatever. On the other hand, if I study only interesting populations, I'm a really intuitive epidemiologist or health educator or maternal and child health researcher, then I might find that although all of these interesting populations have true odds ratios that are greater than one, by chance, some of the samples I get will be to the left of this line. In other words, my, I would get study results that would be down on this end. And some of those are pretty close to a null odds ratio, and I'll say, no, no association. So in this case also, the results of the data don't tell me the probability that the data come from an interesting population. Okay, well, of course, few of us study only boring populations, and nobody that I know studies only interesting populations. But let's suppose I study mostly boring populations and a few interesting populations, which is really quite plausible. Well, then my p-values will be in flat, in, I mean, a lot of those quote-unquote significant results that I get will be reflecting these boring populations. And a few of the significant results I get will be reflecting the interesting populations. On the other hand, if I have mostly interesting populations that I'm studying, then conversely, the quote-unquote significant results will reflect mostly the interesting populations, and even some of my non-significant results will reflect the interesting populations. So let's suppose that I study mostly boring populations. And there's an argument that one could make that it's hard to come up with a good hypothesis that really reflects what's going on in the world. And so it's more likely maybe that a lot of hypotheses are not so good. Um, so let's suppose that I'm studying 10 interesting populations and 100 boring populations. In my career, I have a career, I do 110 studies. In 10 cases, I had an interesting population means that there was really something going on. Uh, the association I was hypothesizing was really there. And then 100 boring populations, meaning that there was no association, and so anything I find would be due to chance. Well, if I'm operating at this conventional statistical significance level of 5%, the, the magic P05, then of these 100 boring populations, how many will look inter how many samples will I get that will look interesting? So I study 100 populations. In each case, I've got a sample of data from them. How many of those samples will make it seem that I've got something interesting? They will be, quote, unquote, significant. Five, because out of 100, 5% 5 is five. So at the 5% significance level, significance level, excuse me, I can expect that in my 100 studies of boring populations, five will give me results that look interesting, that I can publish and, and, all, and so on. And then of these 10 interesting populations, let's assume my statistical power, which is the probability of detecting an association that actually exists. Let's suppose that my statistical power is 90%, which is better than it often is for people. It's often 80% or even sometimes lower. So if it's 90%, then on average, over these many investigators who study 10 interesting populations each, nine of them will produce samples that will be interesting. Okay, that means that of the 10 studies that I do in interesting populations, in nine of those studies, I will get significant results, and in one, I will get a non-significant result. So let's summarize the results. There were 14 interesting samples, okay? Five from boring populations, and nine from interesting populations. So the probability that an interesting sample came from a boring population is five, because there were five from boring populations divided by a total of 14, which is 36%, not 5%. But I was doing all this at the 5% significant level. So when you see some data or an article or whatever, and somebody comes to you and say, but that's not significant at the 5% level, what are they saying? They're worshiping at a false god. Does that mean that, therefore, we should make the significance level 36%? No. This was based on an assumption about how many boring populations I studied and how many interesting populations. There is a way to compute p-value, I mean, to compute probabilities like that. It's called Bayesian statistics, but I'm not going to try to get into that. So this is analogous to predictive value, as you've probably realized, because we can think of sensitivity as 
the statistical power is like sensitivity. It's the probability of finding something that's there. We can think of specificity as 1 minus the p-value. It's the probability of declaring that there's nothing there when in fact there's nothing there. And as you remember from the sensitivity and specificity lesson, predictive value is influenced very strongly by prevalence, right? The prevalence of the condition. And so if the prevalence of interesting sample, uh, interesting populations is low, then your predictive value, which is this Bayesian probability, will be not very high, your positive predictive value. So anytime you get in doubt about this, use the sensitivity and specificity predictive value an analogy, and I think you'll see that it's, you're on familiar terrain, and it will help you to get a grasp of this. Yes? The type 1 error is finding a sample that looks interesting from a boring population. And the significance level is the probability threshold you set for making a type 1 error. A type 2 error is the mistake of having a boring, or of getting a boring, probably of getting a boring sample from an interesting population. And so the statistical power tells you 1 minus the probability of a type 2 error. Is that Help. Does that help? Yeah, it's a good question, actually. Okay. <coughs> so uh, here's my table with the... Uh, I'm not keeping up with my slides here. Here's the table to do specificity and sensitivity with the data that I just had. There were 14 studies, five, 14 interesting-looking studies. Five came from born populations, nine from interesting populations. So the positive predictive value that an interesting population is present was nine divided by 14. And you can see that here are the 10 interesting populations. And I detected nine of them with my P less than 05 criterion. So that is my sensitivity, or 1 minus the probability of a type 2 error. Here are my 100 boring populations. And here are five that the samples looked interesting nevertheless. That's my false positive rate, 5 over 100, which, is, which corresponds to the P value. And specificity, of course, is 1 minus the P value, or 1 minus the false positive rate, 95 over 100, that would be 1 minus the key value. I know I went through this pretty quickly, but I figured you can get to read it. Maybe you have read it. Does this, oh, is this okay so far? Should we go ahead? I mean, it, it takes a while. I've been looking at this thing now for about 15 years, uh, and it's gradually kind of sinking in, and uh, I'm feeling that I really understand it more. So, so much for our excursion into p-values. So what should guide data analysis? The main question is, what are the research questions? When you embark on a study, you have something that you want to find out. It's very helpful if you can be specific about what you want to find out. And it's also very helpful if you can develop a rationale. The rationale is something that is the most difficult often for all of us, and that's especially true in the early years of I mean, when you're a student, when you're doing your dissertation or something. Why is this question worth answering? What will we learn as a result, and what difference will it make? That's what the rationale addresses. And if you can't answer this, what for, why, so what's the bottom line, what's the payoff, then that suggests that you haven't thought through a rationale that is going to be persuasive to people. And your dissertation, you may not have to persuade too many people. If you go to get grant funding, you've got to persuade some committee. Not only that the study is valid, but that the study is worth doing, because the committee has to have to be enthusiastic. So your research questions could be something like, I want to estimate means or prevalences. I want to see how the mean cholesterol level has been changing over the past couple of decades. Or I want to look at the prevalence of HIV or the prevalence of uh, diabetes or, or whatever. So they could be simple estimation questions. Or they could be questions relating to associations. In this case, it would be the estimation of an association. So for example, is the blood lead level associated with elevated blood pressure? Do elevated levels of blood lead lead to elevated blood pressure? Or maybe do prepaid health plans provide more preventative care than fee-for-service plans? Just a little interlude here on trend analysis. Our numbers are way down. What should we do? Reorganize the department so there's no valid history for comparison. Then we'll fire a few people and give ourselves awards for saving money. That would be awkward. 
Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. So the research questions guide the data analysis. So we're going to have research questions and we're going to come up with a rationale. So many of the research questions that we study in public health are questions related to causation, to uncover risk factors, to try to decide whether some risk factor is actually causal and actually if we change it, we could prevent the outcome or something is preventive. And by bringing it into a situation, we can actually reduce disability and disease. So here are some examples of causal relations, of questions that hinge on causal relations. Does dietary fiber prevent colon cancer? Do abstinence-only sex education programs raise the age of sexual debut? Your federal dollars are spending now going for about a billion federal dollars. It's <coughs> unbelievable. Health education has never been so well off. A billion federal dollars are going for abstinence-only education programs. Do you think the evidence justifies this? No, but here's your chance to see if it does, or to see if you can, can demonstrate it. So here is a causal question that could be addressed through epidemiologic data. What level of arsenic in drinking water is harmful? Arsenic is an expensive kind of thing to get out of the drinking water, and when the level gets very low, the cost to get rid of it is going up considerably. So how much difference does it make? Or does higher patient volume reduce, for example, knee replacement complication rates? Let's say you need surgery or a family member needs surgery, and they, do they go to the hospital nearby? Is it better for them to go to a hospital which may be farther away, less convenient, whatever, but they do a larger volume, so maybe the physicians are more in practice or the facility is better set up for it? Again, an empirical question. Now, in general, we cannot see causal relationships. We have to infer their existence. Even when we think we're seeing it, we're actually having to make some inferences that we may not be describing. And I submit that proving causation really means creating a belief, a belief on our part and a belief on the part of others that a causal relationship obtains. Causal inference is therefore a social process. And what we regard as causes also depends on our conceptual framework. So throughout history, there have been many causal relations that have been studied, or at least opined on, and recommendations have been made. And these have been made without, in most cases, the benefit of epidemiologists, or in many cases. Food poisoning, for example, probably resulted from shellfish and pork. I mean, it results from those uh, foods when they're not properly preserved uh, <coughs> and prepared. And so these are prohibitions that are in religions. It seems likely that those prohibitions arose because people found that, in fact, you could get violently ill, even die, from eating foods like this before they knew safe ways to prepare them and preserve them. Plumism uh, was a disease that the Romans identified uh, from wine kept in lead-glazed pottery. Plum is the Latin word for lead. So that they called this disease plumism suggests that they actually made this connection to lead-glazed pottery. The knowledge of contagion was, was present in the Middle Ages. People used isolation and quarantine to prevent communicable disease, diseases from spreading. And then here's the first epidemiologist entering on the scene, James Lind, did studies where he showed that you could cure scurvy by feeding people citrus fruit. These were sailors, of course, on voyages and so on. Scurvy was a big problem for the British Navy. And James Lynn, the British epidemiologist, British physician, demonstrated that you could actually cure scurvy with citrus fruit of tremendous importance. And the British Admiralty didn't pay attention for decades. Uh, scrotal cancer, another British epidemiologist, Percival Pott, discovered that scrotal cancer was much greatly elevated in chimney sweeps. And the Danish Guild of Chimney Sweeps used this knowledge to introduce hygienic measures that greatly reduced scrotal cancer in Denmark. But again, the Britons weren't ready to join, so it took them another 100 years to act on the findings. Was, that not a, was there a lack of success in demonstrating a causal connection? Or was it the belief that wasn't met? Or were there other reasons? And there could well have been other reasons. Smallpox vaccination has made an enormous difference in our lives, even though we don't think about it now. Uh, except in respect to possible terrorism. terrorism. Smallpox vaccina vaccination was actually introduced by the Turks, who somehow found that if you infected people with small amounts of smallpox, very tiny amounts, they would actually be somewhat protected against 
actual smallpox, acquiring live smallpox from, from people, that, that, or the illness would be less serious. And then, of course, Edward Jenner found that cowpox vaccination would do, have the same beneficial effect without nearly the risk that resulted from smallpox vaccination. Unfortunately, he couldn't get his paper published by the Royal Society, so he had to publish it as a monograph and didn't get credit for a peer-reviewed publication. William Budd demonstrated that typhoid fever was transmitted through water. John Snow demonstrated that cholera was transmitted through water. Uh, Peter Panem uh, uh, discovered uh, on the island, the Faroe Islands in Denmark that measles was transmitted from person to person, and he very carefully documented the latency time that's from one case to the infection to ability to transmit to another person. Uh, and puerperal fever, uh, which was childbearing child fever, uh, which was a terrible killer of women who were delivering. Um, Igne Semmelweis, a Hungarian, discovered that it was actually due to, it was an iatrogenic disease, it was due to <coughs> physicians contaminating the pregnant woman during their examinations because they hadn't washed their hands effectively. Unfortunately, <coughs> he, he earned the undying enmity of the, of the medical community for that. Uh, and unfortunately, hand washing is one of those boring things like data management and backup that it's very hard to get people to do. So we're still trying to take full advantage of his discovery. Now what's interesting is <coughs> all these major advances, which were really quite extraordinary and transformed life, were made without the ability to see the causal process. These organisms that were being hypothesized could not be seen during this period of time. It wasn't until the discovery of the microscope that they could actually see the organisms. So these major discoveries were made through inference, which is basically how we make discoveries today. Even when the invention of the microscope made it possible to actually see germs, microorganisms, it still was necessary to infer that the microorganisms were causing the diseases that we thought were related to them. You don't see a microorganism making somebody sick. You might see a microorganism entering a cell, though in those days I'm not sure that they could, they could see that much. But in order to form the connection, it was necessary to come up with some method of inference. So Jacob Henley and Robert Koch uh, developed a set of postulates which were designed to be used to prove, and when I say prove, again, I mean creating a belief in themselves and in others that there was a causal process. And their postulates for demonstrating causal, a causal process are that the parasite, which was their word for the microorganism, the parasite must be present in all who have the disease, the parasite can never occur in healthy persons, and the parasite can be isolated, cultured, and capable of passing the disease to others, such as laboratory animals. Well, we can see that these postulates are actually not really adequate for what we now understand to be all the causal mechanisms with microorganisms. Because there certainly are instances now where you will find people who are healthy, and yet they have the, the organism in them. And that may be because it's a subclinical case, it may be because the body is able to, it is able to wall it off. It may be just that the disease hasn't manifested yet, and so we think the person's healthy, but they're actually incubating a disease which is going to cause trouble. Um, also, depending upon how the disease is defined, there may be people who have the disease, but they don't actually have the microorganism. What happened was that when, for example, syphilis, the syphilis organism was discovered, then the disease syphilis was redefined to mean people who have, who are infected with this organism. And there were a lot of conditions which looked like other diseases were found to be syphilis. Syphilis was actually responsible for a great deal of the mental illness that was putting people in psychiatric hospitals. Syphilis has been called the great imitator because it can have manifestations of so many different varieties that it's without the, the ability to test for syphilis uh, it, there was no way to know that that was the same disease. So you can get the same disease manifesting in different ways, and you can get similar manifestations that come from different, different uh, diseases, so uh, different organisms. So it depends on how you define the disease, whether you can say that the parasite must be present in all who have it. 
Now, although epidemiologists emphasize data and objectivity, we should never forget that the data do not make causal inferences. People do. But the way this happens may be easier to see in other fields. In the, in the series of lectures entitled What is History? The celebrated British historian Edward Hallett Carr explains the thinking process of the historian in interpreting the record of the past. And this is something I actually read in my freshman year at college, and for some reason I saved the book. It's a wonderful book. History, he says, is a selective system of causal orientations to reality. From the infinite ocean of facts and the multiplicity of sequences of cause and effect, the historian extracts those and only those which are historically significant. And the standard of historical significance is his or her ability to fit them into his pattern of rational explanation and interpretation. Other sequences of cause and effect have to be rejected as accidental, not because the relation between cause and effect is different, but because the sequence itself is irrelevant. The historian can do nothing with it. It is not amenable to rational interpretation and has no meaning either for the past or the present. And he illustrates this with a little anecdote uh, about a man named Jones who is driving from a party where he's had too much to drink in a car with defective brakes at an intersection with poor visibility. Uh, and he runs down a, a man, he ro Robinson, who was, was crossing the street to buy cigarettes. So in analyzing this incident, we would entertain alcohol, defective brakes, and poor visibility as causes of Robinson's death. We probably would not say cigarette smoking was one of the causes. Even though, had Robinson not been a cigarette smoker, he would probably not have been crossing the road and would not therefore have been killed. Because in our conceptual model of how things happen and what is useful to us, the smoking isn't useful whereas those other causes do indicate potential lines of intervention. Well, it's one of the more challenging issues is when do we have enough evidence? So when is our belief strong enough to act? Uh, Austin Bradford Hill, a, a uh, British biostatistician um, from the 1950s and 60s and I guess probably 40s, writes that all scientific work is incomplete, whether it be observational or experimental. All scientific work is liable to be upset or modified by advancing knowledge. That does not confer upon us a freedom to ignore the knowledge we already have or to postpone the action that it appears to demand at a given time. But, what action is demanded by the knowledge at a given time? This was a central issue confronting the U.S. Surgeon General's Advisory Committee on Smoking and Health, which was convened, convened by Surgeon General Luther Terry and produced the historical landmark Smoking and Health Report of the Advisory Committee to the Surgeon General of the Public Health Service in 1964. The history of the 1964 Surgeon General's report is a fascinating story, which is available at the National Library of Medicine website, and I have the URL uh, in the text copy of my lecture, which contains links to the report itself, which is certainly worth taking a look at. So consider the situation at the time. In 1964, when the advisory committee, of which Austin Bradford Hill was a member, was deliberating, there were over 7,000 studies of smoking and health hard to believe that 40 years ago there were already 7,000 studies. During the 20th century there was a long existing concern about the health effects of smoking. And, but although a number of studies had appeared, it wasn't until 1950 that things started to get hot. There were three major studies published. One by Ernst Winder and Evarts Graham in the Journal of the American Medical Association one by Sir Richard Dahl and Austin Bradford Hill in the British Medical Journal, and then another one in the Journal of the American Medical Association by Morton, Levine, Morton Levin, Hyman Goldstein, and Paul Gerhardt. It's interesting that the Journal of the American Medical Association was going to turn down the Winder and Graham study, the first one showing this dramatic connection between smoking and lung cancer, uh, because they thought it just, it, it was just couldn't be. Uh, and it wasn't until they were persuaded by a senior epidemiologist and physician that, that the data were good enough that they should be published that it actually appeared there. 
1962, the committee of the, a committee of the Royal College of Physicians in Britain issued a report indicting cigarette smoking as a cause of lung cancer, bronchitis, and probably of cardiovascular disease. So this was pretty serious, but in the United States, we hadn't done that. Lung cancer was a burgeoning problem. You remember from earlier in the course, I showed you those graphs of cancer rates, cancer mortality rates for different causes, and lung cancer was well up there in 1950. Tobacco was a major industry. This state is heavily dependent upon it. Our university friend up the road built with tobacco money. Our state, I mean our university, where those taxes come from, tobacco money. So thousands of lives and billions of dollars rode on the outcome of the advisory committee's deliberations. So intense was the interest in the deliberations, as you might imagine, that the committee agreed among themselves that none of them would quit smoking. Yes, there were smokers on the committee because, you know, like 80% of men smoked and the committee was, I think, all men or mostly men. So that was hardly surprising. But they agreed among themselves that as the data, uh, as they looked through the data, they, nobody would quit smoking. <laughs> because if they did, they figured it would telegraph to the press that were watching them all the time what their conclusion was going to be. The deliberations by the advisory committee were the largest scale and most prominent effort to date to reach a conclusion largely on the basis of epidemiologic evidence. So the committee vigorously discussed various meanings of the term cause and specifically noted that, quote, its considered decision to use the words a cause did not imply that smoking was the only factor in lung cancer. Because of the centrality of epidemiologic evidence, for a conclusion about the effects of cigarette smoking on health, the committee arrived at certain criteria which were, in their words, quote, especially significant for judgments based on the epidemiological method. The committee explained that, quote, the causal significance of an association is a matter of judgment which goes beyond any statement of statistical probability. To judge or evaluate the causal significance of the association between the attribute or agent and the disease or effect upon health, a number of criteria must be utilized, no one of which is an all-sufficient basis for judgment. And then they listed criteria one to four and seven from the list on the slide. And that list which you see here now, I'm going to go through them in order. Uh, this list of nine comes from a publication of a classic article by Austin Bradford Hill called The Environment in Causation. So let me go through these criteria one at a time to show you how we use them. The first criterion listed by Hill was strength of the observed association. Although the thrust of his article was on whether or not an association is causal, the first question is, well, is there really an association? So is, it, is what we're seeing something that's due to selection bias, maybe, or information bias? or confounding. So we want to see whether we think there really is an association. And part of the evaluation of that concerns how strong is that association. The reason being that a strong association is less likely to be totally caused by confounding. Confounding means that you're seeing the effects of other variables on the data. And the extent of the influence of confounders depends upon the strength of those associations and how strongly the confounders are associated with the variable that you're looking at. So if you find a very strong association and smoking and lung cancer had a risk ratio of around 8 or 10, that means it's very unlikely or it's much harder to think of how some other variable or variables could be creating the appearance of that association. Of course, selection bias and misclassification bias could still do it, but confounding is less likely. But what do we mean by strong? How strong is strong? Well, this is a scale that I've created. Usually we think about the ratio measure of association. And this scale I've created with some attention to how people describe associations in the literature. And if you take the logs of these, you'll see it's a nice linear scale. If you see a risk ratio of four or five or six, I think most people would call that strong. If you see a risk ratio of 1.4 to 1.7, I'd say, people would call that modest. And of course, if you have an odds ratio, you'd have to think about whether the disease is rare or not, 
if the disease is rare, you can estimate the same scale will work. If the disease or outcome is not rare, <coughs> then the odds ratio will be an exaggeration, and so you need to take that into account. If you have a preventive exposure that you're looking at, so that the risk ratio is less than one, then you can just take the reciprocal and look it up on this scale. Now, an association with a relative risk of 1.1, 1.2, I've called weak, and that is what we often would hear people call it. But that does not mean that such an association is not important, because importance depends upon how many people might be affected. So if you have something like coffee, which is ubiquitous in terms of its consumption, even a very small elevation in risk could have a large impact on public health. Whereas even something that has a very strong association, if it's a rare exposure, in terms of public health importance, might not be as big. Hill's second criterion, and one that is widely used in science in general, is consistency. Consistency for Hill is the replication of the finding of the association in other studies. Replication is more persuasive when the association has been observed by different investigators, in different populations, in different places, because it seems unlikely that the same error would be made by different people, in different places, and so on. It's valuable to see the association replicated with the same procedures in the same definitions and everything, because that shows a real replication. But it's also of interest to see whether the association will be found when you use other definitions of your exposure and disease, other populations and so on. That shows how robust this association is. Now, of course, this is a difficult criterion to apply when you have a one-time event like Love Canal. And in fact, none of these criteria is really not only is no one criteria sufficient, but no one criteria is essential in inferring causation. Hill's third criterion, which was also one employed by the advisory committee, was specificity of the association. And I prefer to think of this in the general term, does what we see in the data conform to what our conceptual model says we should see? If we expect to see a specific causal relation, like a risk goes up with the level of exposure, do we see that? If we see what we expect to see, that reinforces that belief. Remember, causal inference is about creating a belief. The more accurately we define the factors, which is a, specific, a specificity of sorts, I mean exposure during this time period with this type of route of entry into the body and so on, then we should see a greater relative risk with the more precise, specific definition of exposure. Now, some people, including Ken Rothman and, and Sandy Greenland, don't think the criterion of specificity gives us anything, uh, and so uh, they actually recommend that it not be used. But I think in this general way of con conformation with the conceptual model, it is a useful criterion. Fourth criterion is temporality. In everyday life, a cause has to be present before its effect, at least by an instant. So when we're looking at the results of, an epi of epidemiologic studies, can we establish that what we think is the cause was there before the event occurred, before this disease event, event occurred? And as you know, in case control studies, in cross-sectional studies, and even in cohort studies when there's a long latency of the disease, it can be difficult to establish that the cause was actually there before the outcome. So subclinical disease states may be present long before the outcome is detected, and it can be difficult to provide this demonstration, but at least in our system and our conceptual approach to causation, if the cause wasn't there beforehand, then we have a hard time seeing it as responsible. Hill's fifth criterion, he called biological gradient, which nowadays people usually use the term dose response. If we have a greater dose of the exposure, do we see a greater response in terms of the outcome? And this, this assumes, of course, that our conceptual model is one that suggests, predicts, that if we have a greater exposure, we'll have a greater outcome. One reason that this is, is, is meaningful and persuasive is that, again, finding the data that fit the conceptual model. Another reason is we often think that the kinds of bias that would occur, selection bias and information bias, although they might produce an association, might be less likely to produce a dose-response association. 
But of course, if our biological model is one that predicts a threshold beyond this level, more exposure doesn't matter, or a saturation point up to this level, uh, excuse me, a threshold would mean up to this level, it doesn't matter, the response comes only after a certain level of exposure, or saturation, meaning that after a certain level of exposure, more, more exposure isn't going to make a difference, um, then we would expect the data to conform to that. That would not be saying that those response doesn't, isn't, isn't there. So here's an example of a threshold situation where you have the dose going up and up and there's no response in terms of incidence until this point. And saturation would be illustrated on the right where you have the dose going up, the response going up, but after a certain point, additional doses don't really make any difference. The sixth criterion is plausibility. He meant biological plausibility, but of course the same would apply for psychological knowledge, social knowledge, and so on. Can we explain the relation on the basis of existing biological or psychosocial or psychological knowledge? Obviously, it's easier to persuade people that a causal relation exists if it fits their understanding of how biology works. That's problematic for new types of causes. And so if I said, you know, I think that actually psychiatric disorder can be transmitted by thoughts, you would think that I was probably falling into a psychiatric disorder. But conceivably, it could happen, and it will be very difficult to persuade people that it does happen. Coherence means, does everything that we know about this association, this cause, potential causal relation, fit into a coherent picture? So we look at the descriptive epidemiology of the exposure and the disease by person, by place, by time, and related biological and economic and geographical factors. It's kind of like the detective looking at all the evidence in a murder mystery and saying, do all the pieces of the puzzle fit into place? We want to see all the pieces of the puzzle fit into place in terms of inferring causation. Experiment is Hill's term for randomized controlled trial. As we know from our studies, our, our review of study designs, randomized trials have <coughs> the unique advantage of giving us some control for causes of the outcome, potential confounders, that we don't know and can't, or can't measure. So randomized trials give particularly important information, particularly strong evidence for causal inference. But even with randomized trials, we need to interpret the results. They are not, they, they rarely give us a definitive answer completely. And finally, Hill's ninth criterion is analogy. I'm just going to go on a couple more minutes, even though I'm, I'm, I'm at the edge, but I have a couple, just a couple things to say. <coughs> the ninth criterion is analogy, which, like plausibility, is similar to plausibility, but it's a weaker criteria. It just means that we are readier to accept something similar to what we've seen in other contexts. So if we've seen something, if we've seen, for example, that rubella can cause birth defects, then the idea that some other exposure that a to a, mo a mother who's carrying a baby produces a defect in the baby would cause that, that's easier for us to believe. We're quicker to accept it because we have the model of rubella and congenital malformations. And this criterion illustrates, again, the point that causal inference involves getting people to change their beliefs. I think there's actually an interesting parallel between causal inference and epidemiology and the law. In both cases, a decision about facts must be reached on the evidence available. We can't get all the evidence usually. So there is an emphasis on the integrity of the process of gathering and presenting information and a requirement for adequate representation of contending views. There are different standards of certainty for various potential consequences. A criminal conviction requires a higher standard of, of certainty than a civil decision. There's a reliance on procedural, or in epidemiology we call these methodological safeguards, since the facts are established only as findings of an investigatory process. And justice, which in the case of epidemiology means proper procedures and methodology, must be done and also must be seen to be done. And increasingly, of course, epidemiologists and epidemiologic data are entering the courtroom, and there are courtroom debates about epidemiologic questions. So finally, uh, the, printer ran out of ink, uh, the printer ran out of ink again, so I can't finish my report, so I'll just go play video games. Oh, no, you don't. Luckily, I just happen to have a new ink cartridge right here, Rumble. Why do I have to do all this homework? So you can get good grades. 
Why? So you can get into a good college. Why? So you can get a good job. Why? So you can make lots of... The important thing is for you to enjoy what you're learning. Why? And finally, don't let worries kill you. Let the church help you. Thank you very much. It's been fun. Sorry to keep you late. And I'll see you later with our camera.